Hello, everyone. I'm Mathieu Lausanne Dixo. I'm uh, your moderator for today's very special event, which is part of the new speculative fiction program in the Blue Metropolis Festival, a program that I coordinated with my colleague Pascal Laplante Dubé. Today's event is a tete a tete or face to face on science and literature, specifically on the topic of biology and parasitology part of a series of four similar discussions online and in person during which a scientific expert and a renowned science fiction writer are invited in a dialogue about the many questions and furthermore the many answers and then the many more questions that, uh, that feed their work both in research and in creation. So I'm therefore delighted to introduce you uh, Primi Mohamed. Uh, Primi is an Indo-Caribbean Indo scientist and speculative fiction author based in Edmonton, Alberta. She's an assistant editor at the short fiction audio venue Escape Pod and the author of novels Beneath the Rising, which, is a which was a finalist for the Crawford Award, the Aurora Prize, the British Fantasy Award, and the Locus Award and the novel A Broken Darkness, as well as novellas These Lifeless Things and What Can We, and, and what can we Offer You Tonight, which is currently a finalist for the Nibla Award, congratulations for me, and recently the annual Migration of Clouds, which uh, just came out with ECW uh, Press. Her next novel, The Vord Ascendant, is the final book in the Beneath the Rising trilogy and is due out in spring 2022, which is then very, very soon, if not right now. <laughs> so welcome to me. And then we're also in the company of Dr. Tavi Long. And Dr. Tavi Long is an assistant professor in, uh, at the Parasitology Department of the Faculty of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at McGill University. She obtained her MSc thesis in genetic and microbiology and her PhD in cell biology from the University of Lille in France. During her PhD with Dr. Colette Dissous, she developed an interest in the molecular uh, and cellular biology of certain types of parasitic flatworm of humans. Recently, she gained expertise on the biology of filarial parasites including the heartworm Dirofilaria imitis that infects companion animals by investigating the signaling pathways that govern the development of the infective stage. As an assistant professor at the Institute of Parasitology, Dr. Long is interested in understanding the molecular mechanisms involved in developmental processes and metabolism of flatworms in order to identify novel targets that could potentially be the basis for new antiparasitic drugs. In, in addition, our research is focused focus on finding new ways to monitor the development of drug resistance in parasites. She also has a postdoctoral fellowship from the prestige Marie Curie Fellowship postdoctoral fellowship program. And now I feel like I have so, so, so much to learn from you after reading your biographies and that I know absolutely nothing, which is exact, exactly why I'm happy to be here. And I can't wait to hear both of you talk. Uh, and then maybe with this first question that I would like to throw at you just to start like this. So we, we will be able to talk about biology as a whole if you want to go in many different directions, but there's a common uh, point with both of your work and your research on parasites. And we see right now the beautiful background of Travi that connects to this. So my question would be this about parasites. So like their, their name is, I mean, to me, for example, it's associated to disgust, something that we, don't want to touch, don't want to be part of, that we fear. So it's something that is scary as well. So we imagine them as being small beings that you know suck the life stream of us and that we cannot control, we cannot get rid of them uh, by ourselves. So what does it do to write about them, to fix them in fiction, 
to study them through storytelling, but also to, to research them through scientific uh, researches, uh, to deepen our knowledge on them. When it comes to that fear of the unknown, uh, that fear of the danger and the unknown danger that they represent, how, how does it feel to work on these parasites that are so scary for everyone? And then an underlying question, what brought you, I mean, it's like a very introductive question, you know, we can go very deep after, but what brought you personally as person <laughs> in Parasites? So I could start with Travi, with the research elements of it, if you would like to start with this. Um, so yeah, so it's a very interesting comment about the fact that Parasites are disgusting. You're not the only one, Matthew. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of people think that. But um, there's also good, there's also benefits from uh, parasites because um, if, if you don't know, some parasites are studied because they secrete some uh, proteins that could cure other diseases. So they are, even they are disgusting, they, are, they can be also helpful to treat other disease, human diseases, um, such as inflammatory diseases. And um, so what brought me in this field is um, my first uh, lecture on, on parasitology. Uh, the professor that I had was really passionate that kind of also transferred his passion on me. And uh, when I started to work on parasite, I was working on um, Toxoplasma gondi, which is a parasite uh, we, it, it's not a really uh, dangerous parasite, but it's more dangerous for people who are uh, immunocompromised or um, pregnant women. And uh, I was really just um, just looking at them in the microscope. I was just passionate how this small thing can be so smart and can do a lot of things in people and use um, the, the metabolism of uh, humans. And the one that I, I kind of fall in love with is uh, Schistosoma monsoni, which is the one in uh, my uh, background, which is a um, flatworm parasite. And uh, the thing that I really loved about this parasite is that they have a unique uh, reproductive biology, meaning that the female of this parasite lives for all their life in the body of the male. So they, they live as a couple, all their life. And this is the way how they lay uh, eggs. And the eggs is the consequence of the pathology. So this parasite is just has find a way to survive and um, also not to, to kill the, the human. It's just using uh, the, you know, like the, the food, it feeds from blood. And uh, it's just as, you know, the fact that they live as pairs all their life and they lay eggs, uh, it's their strategy to survive. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, each time I look at one parasite in the, in the microscope, I'm just so, um, so happy I live, I, I work in this field because it's, it's like a passion. I will not say that it's work. It's really a, I loved working with them. So yeah. So so you actually have this sense of wonder yes. from your your object of study that yeah. is one of the main um, um, pleasure that we also have reading science fiction as reader. Mm -hmm. We want to be all emerveillé. Uh, we want to be uh, in a one in a wonder state, and this is mm -hmm. what authors of science fiction will often create. So in your case, actually, Primi, so what brought you to that topic, what that subject in your fiction, um, what interests about it? And do you feel that writing it plays on that, on that dealing with the fear and the unknown of it and like understanding it better in a way? Yeah, I think so. And, um... I think what's interesting about parasites in particular is you don't see them all that often in fiction. Um, as you say, some people find just the idea disgusting, just, oh, there's something that's preying upon me a little bit uh, without my consent, and that's how it makes us living. Oh, how horrible. Um, 
I guess so there was there was partly that wanting to kind of probe into that, especially when we think of, you know, ourselves as human beings, as in control of our environments, as in control of our bodies. And then you have these things, these parasites that don't care. And, you know, they'll they'll feed off you if they want to. Uh, you don't have any control over that. So there was partly that concept of it, but also leaning into the whole, you know, um, the visibility too of parasites. You know, you can't look at someone and know whether they've got an endoparasite, for instance. You might look at them and know if they've got an ectoparasite because they'll have a mosquito on their arm mm -hmm. or something. But I think I was also thinking of things like, um, you know, ticks on on moose up in the north if there are enough ticks on a moose it can actually kill it and each individual tick isn't doing very much damage so i kind of wanted to to probe into that as well um this idea that oh well you know maybe it's not so bad maybe we the characters and we the readers can look at this and say well uh it isn't so bad well it's not so bad until there's you know a very big load of it and also I guess in the book itself um not not entirely on purpose but I was talking to uh someone from an English department a while back and they brought this up and and she said do you think it's uh also like a metaphor for colonization so these people um end up with these parasites that are living off them uh in the past they were referred to as a hereditary symbiont um everyone who's got it disagrees that it's a symbiont they say it's a parasite <laughs> And maybe Tabby can go into uh, a better description than I can about the difference between a symbiont and a parasite and a commensal organism. But basically, the people that have this disease in the book um, very much feel colonized and they would like to get rid of it if they can. And they can't. And there's that, that lack of control again that's interesting um, in a fictional narrative, but I think also interesting when we look at um, ourselves as people, and again, how we look at um, our health, our lives, what's in our hands and what's out of our hands. I really wanted to probe into that. So, so actually, Travi, like what, like what Premi just said, is there a like a like a basic knowledge that we could share right now, which would be like a, maybe a typology of parasites? Um, because you mentioned toxoplasma, but which is not at all the kind of parasite that you work on in your research. And in um, a Primi uh, novella, uh, The Annual Migration of uh, Cloud, we have another type of parasite, which is a fungi parasite, which connects, it feels like it connects to the, I mean, to the whole body at some point, but to the nerves and so on. Um, so is there, um, different types of parasite that are easier to apprehend maybe for us and then after that that we can more easily bring into fiction such as science fiction um oh, can you clarify uh, for um when you say apprehend like uh that, uh, um, look that at we them? can that we can visualize or understand or actually like like envision as a whole. Okay. Yeah. Do you mean like a parasite that uh, people uh, know? Uh, I will say, I will um, say that I think most of people know uh, the malaria parasite, which is a Plasmodium mm -hmm. falciparum, which is the most common. Um, it's a unicellular um, parasite. So there's different types of parasites. There's like really um, unicellular, so really um, single cell uh, parasite, and there's multicellular, so more complex and bigger, um, such as the, the parasite in the back. But there's also even bigger than just microscopic. Some of them you can just see by eye, um, you know, like a, a parasite from um, wild animals or from buffaloes, etc. They are uh, 30 centimeter uh, uh, size of parasites so these are really disgusting <laughs> but but, um, but when you when we talk about science fiction and parasites you know mm -hmm. there's parasites that looks like uh, uh, you know like one um, which is uh, hookworms it looks like alien 
you know, yeah. like it, it has uh, teeth. And uh, so there, there's like um, maybe some people who, who read, who, who write, uh, authors who write uh, novels about science fiction. I don't know if they have looked at anything on parasites or uh, microscopic animals, but there's things that resemble um, to, uh, to that. So I don't know, Premi, but I know that you, you were working on, on parasites. So how did you come to, to write on parasites? Because it's not common. I would say that people write on virus, you know, infection <laughs> or things like that. But why parasites? Yeah, good question. Um, literally, uh, it came from a tweet that I saw uh, that was about a paper written about a hereditary symbiont. I didn't even read the paper. <laughs> I just fixated on the phrase because I thought it was so interesting. I thought, oh my God, a, a parasite or, or symbiont that you can inherit. And again, I think they were talking about Wolbachia in the paper, uh, which is actually a, a really, really interesting. Um, I don't even know if you'd call it a parasite. Uh, maybe Tabby can go into more detail about that, but um, I don't I don't know about the difference between uh, an infection with a disease and a parasite, but anyway, uh, I started thinking about uh, what what kind of a disease could you get if you could inherit a parasite, um, and and what would this parasite kind of look like? And I, I based it, I guess, a little bit on Toxoplasma gondii, and um, I thought also about Cordyceps, which has been used in um, the Emma Carey book, The Girl with All the Gifts, uh, although I haven't read that one yet, and. Uh, I just started thinking about what if you had a parasitic infection? And again, a parasite would not think of itself as a parasite. It would think of itself as a symbiont. It would be like unhealthy. But, you know, what if you had a parasite that wanted to live because parasites want to live? If you had a parasite that wanted its host to live and to be healthy and to be happy and not take any big risks, mm. how would it accomplish that? Um, so first of all, you've got this, you know, this terrible idea. I don't know why I thought to make it a fungus. I just kept thinking funguses are actually really hard to get rid of in a clinical setting. You know, if somebody has certain types of uh, fungal infections in a hospital, that it's it's very hard to kill. But um, I was thinking, okay, well, supposing you've got this this symbiont in your system, and it's generating, let's say, uh, neurotransmitters. Um, or it's it's transmitting, you know, various other chemicals that uh, affect how you maybe can move or how you can think. And for the movement thing, I was thinking cordyceps because it forces you know, the, the arthropod that it's infected with to march up to a high spot so that it can disperse its spores better. Uh, and you know, I was also thinking of uh, risk altering infections like toxoplasmosis is supposed to be um, that alters the, the risk assessment of animals that are affected with it. It makes them more likely to do something risky. I thought, what if you were infected with something that made you less likely to do something risky? Uh, and then that falls into the whole, you know, what <laughs> sort of the existential crisis, what are we? We think of ourselves as a human, one indivisible unit. And then, okay, enough time goes on. Well, okay, uh, maybe there's a body and a soul. And now we have to go, eh, Okay, maybe there's a body and a soul and a microbiome. So there's, you know, the, the creatures that live inside of us are producing things like dopamine and serotonin. And who's to say that the makeup of our, you know, our microbiome isn't already affecting how we think and what we say? And how do you know that this isn't my microbes talking to you right now? <laughs> this is like one of the... Um... The, actually, the one of the main point I would like us to uh, you to talk about, if it's possible, this concept of almost mm, I mean, it's not the right word in the context of science, but the cohabitation of the parasite and its host, um, and how we see it as something that is um, like a, a fight, like a duel between both, and they are fighting. One is trying to take over the other, but in the end, you mentioned it, and it's what we see in your in your novella as well, uh, Pimits. 
it's trying to find a space, a, a place of uh, balance to coexist in the end. So how does that coexistence find its place in actual research? What do you see in research when it comes to the coexistence of the parasite and the host? And then how do science fiction hotter will take that state and bring it elsewhere and then make the parasite, you know, talk to its host and stuff like that, which, and communicate with it, which is what we see in a novella, for example, when he, there's like bursts of communication and some traumatic moments, you know? So like, how, how do, you, do you, is it like a, a point of study to, to see how the coexistence of parasites and hosts um, live together in the end? So yeah, there's a lot of studies about uh, host pathogen relationships, so host parasite relationship, it's trying to understand how um, what are the, the different strategies that the parasite is using to survive inside the host without killing the host. Um, so the, one of the studies that I have is also um, involving um, some proteins that are secreted uh, by the parasites. So um, the the warm parasites, so it's it's, it's a, ca a category of parasites. So they have uh, the ability to um, evade the immune system. So they are not killed uh, by the host. They are hiding. It's, it's a mysterious uh, characteristic of uh, this worm parasite. And we don't know how uh, they evade the immune system. So the host is not, is not able to kill the parasite, but at the same time, the parasite is, cannot divide uh, too much because if not, uh, or cannot multiply uh, too much, if not, it's not gonna kill the parasite. Mm. So um, there's, also, there's a balance between uh, the relationship between the host and the parasite, but also between parasites between each other. Um, you know, they're not going to multiply too much because they, they don't want to kill the, the host. If not, uh, they're not going to survive. But so, some, some parasites uh, need to be, um, can live inside the host, but some parasites can also live or have uh, stages of um, of the parasites that are outside the host. So there's an adaptation also. Adaptation, is it English word? Yeah. <laughs> an adaptation of a parasite through its life cycle. So it, it can, some of the stages, so some of the stages of development of a parasite cannot survive out of the, of the host and some can survive outside, but the one that survive inside knows how to use or to exploit um, things from the host. Uh, you know, for example, um, some, the one parasite cannot synthesize cholesterol, but we know that we need cholesterol to survive. So what they are doing, it's using the cholesterol from the host. So, but we don't know how. So there's like a project that um, involve uh, a better understanding of how they use the cholesterol. So I'm, I'm also working on that. Uh, that can also be used as a new therapeutic strategy, you know, like develop drugs to try to kill the parasite if they are using the cholesterol, which proteins they, they use to, to use the cholesterol and uh, which drug we can develop to kill them. Um, so you have a, the host uh, parasite relationship is uh, the focus of a, a lot of studies. Um, because yeah, if we can stop this communication or the, the, the fact that the parasite is, is exploiting the host, we can kill the parasite and uh, yeah. Or maybe as a host start using the parasite for ourselves for some to improve ourselves potentially, which would be a science fiction trope potentially. Like yeah, this powers. Is, <laughs> this is what I said from the beginning is that parasites are not all of them are disgusting, but most of the warm parasites, the fact that they are known to evade the immune system, this characteristic has been used also as a benefit. Uh, to cure over disease because like inflammatory disease is uh, uh, imbalance of the immune system. So the immune system is not really uh, good. And so 
what uh, researchers are doing is trying to understand which proteins or metabolites, small molecules, or uh, RNA uh, molecules that are uh, released by these worms and whether they can use these proteins to inject to people who have inflammatory proteins and then modulate the, the host immune system. So yeah, so there's a lot of research on that uh, using these uh, disgusting parasites to <laughs> the benefit of, of humans. <laughs> and then when you get into the science fiction of it and then the, these actual potentials, I assume these are richness to use for creating interesting stories and universe and characters and so on and so on. So in your case for Primi, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh my God. I could listen to Savi go on all day about this, but um, yeah, in particular, thinking about um, immune system evasion um, in the novella, the, uh, the disease lies latent for a really long time and it's hard to test for. And of course, there's other things going on at the same time. For instance, the entire uh, Western society is collapsing because of climate change. So there's not as much research into this new plague as there could be, but the latency is a problem. They don't know how it's evading the immune system. You can't test for it. And my understanding is there are many parasitic diseases where that's the case as well, which is while it's in its dormant or latent phase and you take blood tests, for instance, it won't show that you're infected with the parasite because it's sitting there. Um, it may be insisted or something like that. Um, you know, it may be in an inert form or as eggs that isn't reproducing. So it's not showing up as a thing. Uh, so the idea that you could be carrying around this dangerous um, mind-altering enemy was interesting to me. And that also meant in the novella that people were having children without knowing that they were passing this on. So that also contributed to the downfall of everything. But um, the idea of using parasites as something beneficial, uh, that is just so fascinating. And I'm surprised that isn't in more. Uh, science fiction, for instance, because when you look at things like um, cancer treatment that we're trying to do right now, um, you have to get, you know, a chemical compound, say, for instance, or, or a little mRNA or, or something like that, um, some therapeutic agent into the body, past all the immune system, you know, cells that would like to kill it because it's foreign, it's unusual, um, and to the tumor, is there a way that we can use parasites immune evading ability to deliver something like that? Can we change a parasite so that it's useful? So that mm -hmm. it's a little car driving around with these therapeutics in it? Um, because parasites are doing this already. They're very good at what they do. And yeah, the possibilities to me are endless. And I just you know, had another story idea when you said beneficial uses, what if you did have someone unscrupulous who was genetically engineering parasites to produce, say, performance enhancing compounds and just infected someone with them and maybe sent them to the Olympics or something? It doesn't show up on the drug tests. This person is just naturally good at what they do. They're also full of worms. So hopefully the other athletes don't notice it. I don't know. I think it's a very rich um, potential area for sci-fi provided that people don't get too grossed out. The, that that one example you just uh, thought about would be more like of a team competition, I assume, than a team medal, than a single person medal, <laughs> like the the, the sportmen yeah. would with the, the worms parasite. have to get a medal too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have to say because there, you seem to say there's not so much uh, science fiction novels based into. Par developing the, the potential of parasite. And you've been talking a lot about the to Toxoplasma Gondi, and there's an, a very recent novel in French from the uh, author Sabrina Calvo, which is literally titled Toxoplasma. And it plays on this and also of the role of cats with this, because I, you know, but cats are everywhere, you know, in that novel. So it's a very quirky proto cyberpunk novel that takes place in Montreal, actually. So it's like just saying, as a actual bookseller, I'm recommending titles right now. So that's a book to go read. Um, you mentioned the um, there, there was an element you, in your answer earlier, Travi, that I found interesting. And I was wondering if that's the case. You mentioned how the um, so parasites 
between each other have to be careful to maintain the balance so that they don't kill their host. Uh, were you referring to uh, parasites that are of the same species, like the same, like different elements of the same parasites or like parasites of different types that are competing for one um, actual host? Does so that was, happen? Um, I'm sure that it happens. I don't have any example in my mind. But there's, um, you know, like most of the one parasites that I'm that I'm talking are um, infect people from the developing countries. Um, so it's it's what we call also the disease of the poor because it it doesn't appear here, well, except if there's uh, any uh, migration of uh, people that brings the disease. Um, but there's coexistence of uh, different uh, parasites all together, you know, like one parasites, they can have um, the, the one that uh, I'm studying so in, in the back and they, have, they can have malaria at the same time, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why some drugs, so, so some medicines that are working against malaria, but also working on schistosomes, um, so parasites in the back, we cannot use the same drug because we don't want to have any resistance against the drug against uh, in parasites. So there's coexistence. The competition, I, I, I'm not really, I, I will not say no, but I'm not an expert on that. I don't think that's really competition, but there's really um, coexistence. Uh, as Premi was talking about the microbiome, there's really um, a lot of things that are ongoing, uh, especially in the intestine when you have a uh, one parasite that infects the intestine because there's a lot of bacteria uh, over uh, parasites. Uh, but compete, um, I'm not sure. So I'm thinking about the parasite that I am investigating and the one at the institute. Uh, but competing, I don't have any example of competitions of parasites. I don't know, maybe Premi? <laughs> uh, no, not that I can think of, and also my, uh, my microbiology classes were a long time ago. But um, the mention of malaria did make me remember, and this might be an urban myth, that apparently in the early days of, um, of medicine, they would try to cure, I believe it was syphilis, using malaria. So they would infect people with malaria deliberately uh, to induce a really, really high fever as it does, and apparently that would kill off the syphilis bacteria, and then all they would try to do afterwards is cure the malaria. So uh, I don't know if there's a way to play parasites off one another, but I can only imagine that if I was already parasitized by something, I would not take too kindly to a doctor saying, no, let's give you something else, you know, holding up a jar full of worms or something here. But these worms will fix your other worms. I have you. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> It's like, it has, no, go on. Sorry, go ahead. Oh. No, 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 that's true. <laughs> no, the, the, yeah, the fact that uh, warm parasite can be uh, a treatment for disease, it has been uh, performed in animal models. They have shown that uh, animal models who have, um, you know, like inflammatory diseases, like Crohn's disease, can be cured by uh, just infecting with warm parasites. But for sure, no we, cannot, we, we cannot use that for people. But, uh, <laughs> and I will, not, um, I will not recommend to take uh, parasites <laughs> for that. <laughs> not, not yet. Maybe <laughs> later <laughs> when research <laughs> proved it. Uh, earlier, you were talking about how some parasites uh, in extreme ways in fiction, but also in reality, we have example, I think you could present, talk about some of these potentially. So they, they, they are able to use the metabolism to make it do other things. They can they control the host. And it's like this, I, this vision of, you know, like parasites making uh, their host into like zombie uh, walking uh, creatures that, you know, they will uh, do what they want. So we see that in fiction. I was wondering, how exciting is it to write this, but also how um, 
real realistic is it in real life parasitology you know is there any cases of parasites that actually um you know mind alter their host or you know make it do something that it wouldn't normally do and so on and so on uh, that control the 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 host uh, mm -hmm. not really well, we say that uh, the parasitic disease uh, makes people but well, it's like a we say it's a de debilitating disease it's just because it it's a um, it uh, causes a chronic disease so uh, people are really um weak, they cannot go to work, uh, they don't have any social life. So in another way, it controls their life, but not control the person as, um, you know, like making uh, do uh, something that it was not um, decided by the person. Uh, but no, I, I'm not aware of any parasites <laughs> that's doing that. Uh, parasites are really smart and uh, they, they just want the, para the, the host to stay as it is and uh, being unnoticed. Uh, so they're not going to, you know, if they need something, they're going to take the amount that they need, but not too much so it doesn't kill the, the host. Mm -hmm. So so that's actually very interesting. The, the smartness of the parasite in the end is to, to spend the less energy or effort possible to receive as much as what they need and it's almost like in a in a lazy <laughs> way to not do more than what's needed so the this image of uh, what i was describing is really fictionalized it's something that we find in fiction is there is, is this something because in your case in the novella uh, for me the the fungi do does stop the host into doing some certain things that would let's say be too dangerous for itself it will like literally uh, uh, spoiler alert it will block them from moving potentially if there's like a, a feeling of danger or it will make them run away and not help someone that they care for because there's a source of danger right there that they should not get too close to it because it would kill the parasite at the same time so how did you think about that, you know, to make the parasite like a dominant being within its host, in a way. Yeah, and that absolutely was fictionalized. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I'm relieved. I didn't, yeah. <laughs> I'm relieved. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. Um, I think the other problem, too, was that I was mostly going off memory uh, of my older classes when I was coming up with this artificial parasite. So I didn't actually do any research into whether um, people currently actually believe that there are any uh, human parasites that are responsible for affecting what I guess, um, for the sake of argument, we could call free will. Um, the other issue there, though, is how would we know? It's hard enough to study it to begin with. I'm sure we've all seen, you know, the, the neurological and the psychological studies showing that, you know, microseconds in some cases before you decide to lift a hand your brain's already you know sent the signal how much of what we're doing at the moment is free will anyway how much control do we already have over our emotions um, over our movements over our thinking um, you know like we that's something that can't be measured and where we are able to measure it, it's showing some really alarming things, <laughs> which is that in some cases, it may be that your, your muscles and your nerves are moving on their own. And that what we think of as the decision is coming timing wise after the movement. So uh, yeah, I don't, like, I don't like reading those studies. I don't like what they say <laughs> <laughs> about what we think we are, but I did, you know, I, there isn't really room to get into it in a 40,000 word story, but I would have been curious to see what scientists believed um, was the case there. Like for instance, if you are in the woods and you go around a corner and you see a bear 10 feet from you, uh, you'll likely stop. You're probably not thinking, I should stop walking and I will do that now. No, your body just stops you. Uh, so what's, what's happening there? That's chemical. 
that's not related to a direction from your brain saying, I must stop walking. I have seen a bear. Your body stops before it even realizes what it's seen. So I thought, well, if there's something inside of you that can generate those chemicals, why wouldn't it act like a brain of its own? Um, and again, not a very nice thought. <laughs> but I thought maybe this is something that parasite research will discover at some point. Maybe we'll find that there is something like a human cordyceps. And maybe we'll find that it is causing people to do whatever the human equivalent of climbing to the top of the branch out there with all the predators is. Maybe people who skydive have it already. I don't know. <laughs> That's so, a, a, new, uh, a new branch of parasitology to go and discover <laughs> and to, to create through, through all of this. I, then, because in that case, if there's no such known potential of the parasite, I'm actually curious, this is more of a, uh, a uh, just for the fun of it question, so not too serious. I, I'm warning you, I'm going to come with these kind of questions. Are there any known parasite abilities that you feel these are things that should be projected into question into fiction these are elements that we should work on because this this is too cool this is too crazy and cool i would love to see a movie or a book or a story where this is projected far up uh travi maybe you've seen some of the cases of strange parasites that the common people who don't, st don't study the field don't know about it and you wish we knew about these kind of you know beings that have like these spectacular a bit like what you were describing earlier about the the couple uh worms that you know, lives within each mm -hmm. other it's this makes a complete crazy story honestly but like something like that is there like a special creatures or special functions or special like uh, superpowers of parasites that would be great to explore in fiction. Oh, hi. <laughs> <It's a> great <laughs> question. Um, this is really, uh, um, you know, when I'm working on Parasite, I don't think about science fiction. I think about <laughs> reality. Like, if people will know about that, you know, like, because uh, parasitology, it's a field that, as you said earlier, that people don't really know. You know, they, they know that parasites exist, but they don't even know what are really parasites. We know about bacteria or viruses. And uh, about fiction, there's a, each parasite has a characteristic, uh, but for sure, um, um, uh, uh, we talk about um, Schistosoma monstoni, which is the parasite that I studied, about the fact that they are really, um, it's it's really unique in, in the nature of that the, that the male and female is really coupled uh, together all their life. And what the male is doing is that it's it, it's it's called a flatworm because it's, it looks like a, a leaf and it um, the side of a leaf is just curving to allow the, the female to live inside the male. And what is unique also is that the sexual maturation, so the development of reproductive organs in the female, is dependent on the contact with the male. So there has been studies showing that if you remove the female from the male, the reproductive organs just uh, disappear or decrease. And if you put back a female with a male, there's like a stimulus or um, a signal that uh, allow the female to develop uh, the reproductive organs. Um, so it could be, I think, a cool uh, science fiction <laughs> movie, you know, like this dependence uh, between the male and female. And this allow the, the, the parasite to survive, but also uh, to transmit the disease again because it needs to go through a whole life cycle so meaning that the male and female needs to a uh, couple and uh, lay some eggs and the eggs then uh, develop into uh, adult parasites so uh, yeah uh, I think my parasite is 
could be a cool <laughs> <laughs> topic for science fiction. <laughs> I, that's a, a good defense of your parasite. That's perfect. <laughs> oh, that is so interesting. Yeah. Um, and that also made me think of um, anglerfish, which do it the other way around, kind of. So the female anglerfish is the larger uh, creature, and the male anglerfish is tiny, just a little guy. And when he eventually finds a female, he attaches himself to her. He never eats again. And he survives with her blood circulating through him for nutrients and his sperm circulating back into her. So he almost is like a parasite. He's living mm -hmm. off her um, and he never eats for himself or fends for himself ever again, because I guess he's in this very happy marriage. <laughs> Uh, and that also then unfortunately made me think, well, okay, what about vampires? Are vampires parasites? They're not very different from a mosquito. So they prey on humans and they drink blood and they generally, I think, don't kill the host and they don't take so much blood that they do kill the host so that they can go and feed from the host again. And they probably communicate with the other vampires, parasites, um, to ensure that two vampires don't feed on the same person and kill them. <laughs> so... That that's interesting to, to actually dig into um, mythology and folklore as well to see example of human size or human level parasites that then make us understand better actual parasite that you can study. And, a a and very, research. very large yeah. ectoparasite, basically not different from a tick or a mosquito. <laughs> yeah, that's a vampire. <laughs> and... Actually, this is a. Um, I had like this really. Uh, gen this is like a trick question because it's not really an actual science question. But would you consider in that case that? Um, well, before going there, what is the definition itself of a parasite? What defines being a parasite? Like, what does it take to be for a being to be considered a parasite? Like, is there like a, a clear uh, definition or statement for that? Or maybe not. <laughs> it's too, it's a, like, do you need, is it the fact that you're feeding off a host or living from a host? Is it it's, it's living from a host. Uh, but as, as I said earlier, um, some parasite doesn't have all their stages of development that's dependent of a host. So some stages can be dependent of a host. Um, but, you know, like Primi was talking about ectoparasites, so they don't live on uh, inside the host, they live outside, but they need um, to use uh, to uh, feed uh, on the host. Um, yeah, it's living, living from the host. Um, yeah, and there's different. Some are, some of them are um, just single cells. Some of them are more multicellular uh, parasites. Uh, so, in that in mind, this is my actual trick question. I just wanted to make sure that I was not going into something that makes absolutely no sense. But this is a a bad question, but could we consider human beings as actual parasites? Are we parasites? And then it can be philosophical also and, and everything. Are we parasites of each other? Are, are groups of human beings, classes of human beings, parasites of other groups? And is that something that is considered at all in parasitology and, of course, in science fiction and in fiction in general? So... Earlier, I was yeah. going to, instead of using vampires as an example, I was going to use landlords. <laughs> so landlords need a host to exist. <laughs> they feed off the host. Um, if they take too much from the host, uh, the host will get rid of the parasite and they will go somewhere else. So I don't know. I think there may be groups. And again, I was kind of looking at... Uh, at clouds at that too, without trying to be too explicit about it. But what else is something like, say for example, the British empire going to a country and draining you know, the resources out of it and arguably not giving anything back? Because 
when we were talking about the definition of parasites, and again, this goes back years and years and years. My my first microbiology class, I think, was in 1998. So, um, you know, we were talking about, okay, a parasite lives off a host and harms it. And uh, a symbiont lives off a host and doesn't harm it. And then there's commensal, which I think lives off a host and they both benefit, except I can't remember if I've got those correct. But the parasite... Um, definitely, even if the harm is minuscule, it doesn't benefit the host and it does harm the host. So again, I'm thinking, well, that sounds like a landlord to me. <laughs> and again, it, it also sounds like the British Empire showing up in India to drain things from it and, uh, and leave eventually when the host kicks it out. <laughs> Because in a way, the, the way we study parasites and parasitology, the, it's it's interesting how you could see very simple structures of relationships that then make you understand human relationships and people's relationships. And we feel that maybe that's the, one of the reasons why these actual biology parasites are seen as sources of danger, sources of disgust and fear and so on, because we know too well actual cases of that in our own human history and human relationship. And then the reason why we see those parasites as terrible people, terrible beings is because of ourselves, because of our own species, the way we treat each other as humankind, you know? But Trivi, I, I see you like not too sure about it. <laughs> It's not the, the, the same topics. It's like, so in the end, like also what I'm wondering about this is like, is this like then a trope in science fiction itself? Are we going to see the parasitic foreign species as a group, as an invader of human, of earth, of humankind and so on and so on. So, I think that's a, that's a little thing here. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I have a, an opinion about that. Uh, but I was, you know, when you were talking about uh, definition about parasites, except, uh, what is really a parasite, um, I don't know if you have uh, watched uh, the movie that came in 2019, Parasite. There's a, a movie from South Korea called uh, oh. parasite and it's exactly it's human uh you the humans is uh living um just as hiding in a house of uh i don't want to spoil if you if you want to watch it but uh, spoiler alert now you can <laughs> <yeah>. see it <laughs> so it's it's just it's just entering into the house of uh someone who is richer you know, has mm -hmm. uh, a bigger house, more food, etc. And it's just hide on the side in the basement. And it's just during the night, just come and take some food in the, etc. And it's it's really what is a parasite. Uh, so, yeah, I think some humans can be also parasites. Uh, so it... Um, but without the beneficial, yeah, without uh, the beneficial aspects that you find in actual mm -hmm. research, indeed. <laughs> yeah. In the in the um, in the novella, actually, this is something also I because since we're talking about now the a lot of the human and um, aspect of it of and then the the view of people on other affected by the parasite. And then in your novella, um, uh, The Annual Migration of Clouds, there's like this vision and lack of understanding of what people with the fungi parasite uh, feel and go through and actually are because they feel like they might be someone else because of the parasite, because they've been changed, because they might not be controlling and feeling and thinking the same way as they used to. So there's a lot of um, distrust of people with the parasite because you, you don't know if that person is the same anymore, if they've been 
or if they've ever been the one you thought they were and so on. Yeah. So how did how did you play on the, the relationship between two, two people, two, one host and another person and how they see the changes in each other and how they act differently with each other is because of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually so pleased that you, uh, that you noticed that because, yeah, it's um, the, the writing of the parasite kind of was, you know, it's, it's, it's a fine line to tread. I, I look at, you know, myself or other friends who have, say, chronic illnesses uh, or disabilities that aren't immediately visible. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, you know, are people who don't have those looking at us differently? Probably not because they can't see anything. Would they look at us differently if they did know, um, you know, for instance, that someone had uh, had heart failure or had lung damage or something like that, or, or you know, had a viral infection or something that they couldn't see? And it's it's like looking also at people who have mental illness. You tell yourself, "Am I talking to the person right now, or am I talking to the mental illness?" And you know, again, I can tell you that people with it don't like hearing that, or people, uh, you know, with addictions or with substance abuse problems. Am I talking to the person, or am I talking to the addiction? It almost makes you feel like you're back in the 1300s, and you're talking to the village priest, and he goes, "Well, I think you're possessed. Am I talking to you, or am I talking to the demon inside of you?" Mm -hmm. um, it's a very difficult thing to look at the people around you and think. They don't think that they are talking to me, myself, as a person. They think they are talking to the thing that lives inside of me. And I tried to get into that in the story. You know, people do try to look after each other in this community at, at the University of Alberta because they understand that at any moment um, they could, you know, be disabled as well and that they could have a disease that causes them to be chronically ill or to be unable to work. So everyone is kind of watching out for each other, but are they watching out for each other in a different way? Are they looking at someone and saying, oh, you're infected. That means I'm gonna treat you differently. And the person's going, well, I may be infected, but I don't know how much the parasite is affecting me. I don't think it is. Maybe it's the parasite making me think that. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of self-doubt as well. And I, I think that, again, that's the case with the other kind of analogies like sickness or, or addiction or, frankly, possession, is how do we know who we are dealing with anyway? And who's to say? You know, I present myself differently to my friends than I do to my boss. Does that mean I'm two different people? Um, I'm a different person now than I was at the start of the pandemic. Does that mean there are two different people to be considered here? So it's very much also a question of, of self. And so I'm not suggesting that somebody who has like hookworms uh, is a different person <laughs> than who they were before they had hookworm. But um, if other people are going to treat them like that, maybe they are. It's going to be also like that's the whole thing because it it goes back into what we you you were saying earlier about how actual parasites try to um, go in hiding to not be visible. So it becomes, I assume, for people who are affected in real life by those parasites, it becomes something very difficult to deal and cope with because. It might not be visible. You might not be able to show it. It's small. It's inside you. So how is is there such a thing that you see also maybe in your field, Travi, about like the coping mechanism of people and like the the how these affected by the parasites have to deal with parasites in their communities and their yeah. you know, or in but, different uh, cultures uh, and so on. Yeah, unfortunately, this disease. Parasitic disease uh, infects mainly um, people who live in developing countries. So yeah. um, like Hellman parasite, worm parasite infects billions of people. So almost one third of a global population. Um, some of them have just, uh, just a, a chronic disease. So it's not, it can, it's not really visible, but it's more like an impact in their social life. Um, or they have fever, or etc. But there are some of these diseases that uh, 
are really um, uh, change, changing their looking. So there's this um, uh, disease called the lymphatic filariasis, where people have their lymphs that is just swelling. So they are um, they, they look like their uh, legs are swelling. Um, uh, another type of filariasis is elephantiasis. So it looks like they have a uh, feet like an elephant. So for those people, they are really put aside in their uh, mm -hmm. village or cities. And some become blind because some uh, th there's a disease called the river blindness, which is caused by, by uh, um, a filaria parasites and uh, they cannot do anything. So they have to be always with someone who helps them. So there's, uh, yeah, the, the, the look of the other people to, to them change when they, they have a disease. But it's, I would say that it's kind of common in developing countries. So, yeah, unfortunately. So this is interesting because we were often talking about the, you know, as a joke, like the superpowers of parasites as something cool, nice, but actually that's the tragedy of it is that mm -hmm. they are affecting real lives and real people who don't have resources or networks and to, to um, cure themselves and feel better. And I would assume that most of a lot of these um, the conditions that they have because of these parasites if they were in developed countries it would be something very simple to yes get right rid of very yes because uh, most of this disease so schistosomiasis the disease of the parasite in in my background River blindness, as I say, uh, nephrotifiliasis. Um, all these diseases are called uh, neglected tropical disease, so NTD. And neglected because um, they they infect uh, people, uh, poor uh, mm -hmm. people, and also neglected because people don't know much, uh, don't know this disease. You know, like uh, I'm, I'm sure Matthew, you have never heard this name before. No. <laughs> <for> <laughs> And uh, neglected because pharma companies doesn't want mm -hmm. to spend money to develop drugs against uh, this disease. Uh, and as you say, if this disease were in uh, in uh, developed countries in the US, yeah, we will have uh, we will have money to develop drugs. Uh, research in this field will advance uh, really good. It's uh, the best example is uh, the COVID. It's um, it has in fact uh, everyone uh, in the world and especially developed countries. So that's why a vaccine came really fast because we had money to to put on this um, on this field. But uh, it's not the same for um, for the parasites. Parasites. So malaria it's a bit different because. We start. Uh, there's more money um, to develop research on malaria uh, because also because of migration, etc. People uh, get infected not only because they live in, de in developing countries, but uh, most of the parasitic diseases are um, really the disease of the poor. So, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because in, when you get into your novella. Uh, also, so the, the treatment is impossible. It's it's degenerative. It will happen at one point. They they know that their their body will be completely altered, and they will end up dying in terrible uh, pain because there's no structure and no uh, ways to to provide care for them. But then there's that place where the main character might go and we, we don't that's not the actual novella itself i would love to see this a sequel and see if things happen but like the, that we feel like in that developed um sanctuary you know where potentially technology is still available and so on they might not even have cases of the the parasite so that's 
something you've been working also on in your novella for me. Yeah. The access um, to care. Yeah. Yeah, I was very much thinking of that. Oh, also, um, sequels were announced earlier this week. There's a book oh, for two yay. more sequels. So, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so those will be so, coming out uh, 20, what was it, 2024, I think. Two more sequels. So by the time <laughs> this recording happens and this broadcast, it will be a, a month closer to the, we'll the, the release. It's perfect. Yeah, but um, yeah, that was that was an issue for sure, because when I thought of writing this story, um, I came up with the uh, with the disease first. And then my initial thought was, well, if this is affecting rich people, why wouldn't we just cure it? Or why wouldn't we have a vaccine for it? So I thought, well, okay. Um, I still want it to be part of the story. Um, so why don't I set it in the past? And then people can catch it and they won't know what's happening and they can't, uh, they can't cure it. And then I thought, I actually do want there to be some knowledge of of the disease and i want there to be um you know maybe they were getting close to something when everything kind of collapsed so i decided to set it in the future and so the disease was not the deciding factor that caused um you know kind of highly technological westernized society to revert to an earlier stage but uh it didn't help and Westernized technology reverting to an earlier stage didn't help the disease either. So it was kind of a feedback loop. Um, it made it harder to cope with climate change disasters and climate change disasters made it harder to cope with the disease. Um, I think we're even seeing that now possibly uh, with COVID is uh, the fact that there are natural disasters happening during a pandemic. And then you can watch the outbreaks happen in that area because people weren't masked up. Um, they, they don't help each other, they make each other worse. So that very much was uh, some of the thinking behind the disease is exactly as Tavi said, um, if it's affecting rich people, it would have been cured. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in fact, in another one of my novels, um, I believe it's A Broken Darkness, there's a character who's kind of, you know, a very rich philanthropist scientist, and she announces in the book that she's um, globally eradicated guinea worm. And her companion is like, well, I don't know what that is, but you know, good, good for you, I guess. <laughs> but you know, she's she's looking at these neglected tropical diseases because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But right now, pharmaceutical companies are very much like, well, why would we bother? It won't make us a lot of money. So if several, you know, billion poor people have this parasitic disease, that sounds tough. We're not gonna help. It's actually, I mean, I don't, I hope we don't end on like these very <laughs> dark notes and so on. So I hope we'll be able to see what's the hope uh, of the research and of the fiction as well that are dealing with parasites. But it's interesting because in other talks that we've done in that series about the connection of science and science fiction, the a common denominator so far is always how the advancement of the research that we can imagine in fiction and project in like amazing futures in the fiction is always brought back to the dark reality of the fundings of the money that we need to inject into these uh, projects so like so that's why like it's important to see that there are research centers university centers, state uh, 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 programs that inject budgets and in when we need to fight for them actually to, to make these advancements because I, then it means work that you do, Travi, in your department and research will actually affect and improve hopefully people's life. And it's not just theoretical neither. This is the, the beauty of it. Uh, is there, have you actually, uh, seen already uh, an application of your research in people's life as it or is it like in the going of in the making of it no not in not since i'm doing research on schistosomiasis but the goal of 
uh, my research uh, was to develop drugs and treatment against schistosomiasis. So we had, we worked with uh, pharma companies. Um, so I'm going to correct a little bit mm -hmm. when I say that pharma companies are not interested. <laughs> they are trying to develop, but they are trying to develop with things that they have already. So they have tons of drugs, millions, mini, billions of drugs that they have already in their, uh, in their shop, in, in their company, because they have already done so much research for human diseases, for other diseases like cancer, etc. So the parasite, the, the, the genome of the parasites, you know, like genes and proteins, some of them are really close to humans. So the, the, the drugs that the company has developed against human proteins can be used against parasite proteins. So during my uh, postdoc training, I had to collaborate with uh, several company, uh, pharma company where they also shared uh, some drugs. So we find we had some hits. It's what we call hits. It's drugs that are able to kill the parasites. But then we are always... Um, slow down, you know, we advance in developing and finding drugs, but then we are slowed down because we have to apply these drugs in animals and then apply in the field. And this is where the money is mm -hmm. needed because working in the field, uh, you know, like developing clinical trial, it's, it costs a lot. So uh, this is where we are slowed down. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, laboratories that are working on preclinical studies, so trying to find new drugs, um, new therapies, uh, vaccines, etc. But then to go to the market, it's 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 another challenge. It's like the market is going to mm. be the challenge, the, and then the application physically, concretely. The yeah, I assume like you have the tools, you have the 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 mm. medications that is available but then you need to bring it to people and it's that mm -hmm. le level that will slow down because mm -hmm. it's not profitable enough potentially yeah because mm -hmm. ma making the drugs is going to cost and for you know like countries like africa or um, all the developing countries you cannot sell the drugs uh, more than one dollar even one dollar it's expensive mm -hmm. so uh, you, you have to find a good drug but at the same time something that doesn't cost uh, too much so for pharma company if there's no benefit they're not gonna contribute too much so the, the drug that is used for example against schistosomiasis is a drug that has been used for another human disease and just randomly they found that it has an effect against uh, schistosome but it was not the drug that were developed against the parasites. So um, the company, it's, it's Merck, it has been developed by Merck, now is uh, giving the drugs because they're making so much for uh, the human disease that now we can give it for almost free to uh, the other country. So there's, there's like a, a, a campaign uh, where there's a mass drug uh, treatment uh, mass drug administration treatment in uh, developing countries with this drug that doesn't cost too much, but we need always more because uh, it's not it's not a, a vaccine, so it doesn't prevent. It's only a, a drug that you use when people are infected, so um, you have to take it again and again. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And now we're getting into the last couple minutes of our mm. actual discussion. But I, for you, for Premier, I wonder if there's like a to to, to link to that last question. Is there a, a vision of a solution in your world? Is what what do you feel like the would do you feel like in your in the in the future that you're presenting in that novella is the is there going to be a cure to it or will we have as to live with the parasite or will the parasite take over and potentially human is gonna not be needed at that point? Or will we have to read the book to find yeah, out? <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. But, um, but listening to Tappy talk uh, made me also think that uh, one thing we haven't really discussed and we only have three minutes so we can't discuss it <laughs> is um, the environmental control or limitation of these parasites. If people are getting infected, for instance, because of um, infrastructure or their environment or the parasites being endemic in the drinking water, 
maybe we should be looking at stopping parasites, parasitic infections at the source. And maybe that's something that we should have done for the disease in the book if we had had the foresight to think of it to prevent people from getting infected in the first place, now that we know it can't be cured. So I guess uh, if I want to leave anybody with anything, it's um, we should be thinking more about the precautionary principle. And we should be thinking about stopping things before they start, not after they start. <laughs> like the, the words of a wise. So, <laughs> so thank you so very, very much, Premi Mohamed and Travi Long for this beautiful conversation on a beautiful topic. Parasites, not disgusting, beautiful topic. It was extremely interesting to hear you talk about it. So the video will remain available afterwards uh, on, the, on the festival of Blue Metropolis Festival. For people who are interested in the series itself, we also have another conversation that you can find, which was done in French between Derek Kunskan, author of science fiction, and um, an astrophysician uh, from France, Roland Le Houc. Uh, uh, so it is currently available on our platform. And in the few days, uh, donc, uh, first weekend of May, you will be able to uh, assist, uh, to attend two other of these uh, in-person uh, encounter on discussion. One of them will be on anatomy and the other one on artificial intelligence. Look at the full program of the Blue Metropolis to find out more and more even activities about science fiction and literature in general. Again, thank you so much, Primi, Tavi. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>